And lift off. Decollage, lift off from a tropical rainforest to the edge of time itself. James Webb begins a voyage back to the birth of the universe. Separation Webb Space Telescope. Go Webb! You're seeing galaxies that are shining around other galaxies whose light has been bent. And you're seeing just a small little portion of the universe. Stop. Go Falcon, go Dragon. Godspeed, Axiom 1. Together, a new chapter begins. Godspeed, AX-1. As you can tell by the cheers behind us, we can confirm that the Dragon capsule with the AX-1 crew has, has splashed down. And lift off. Starliner is headed back to space on the shoulders of Atlas, powered by a workforce dedicated to its success. Just and seconds you can left. See the mountains coming into frame there. We're getting very close to the ground. And touchdown, Starliner. We're touching down in the desert of New Mexico, marking the completion of orbital flight test two. And that touchdown coming at 5.49 p.m. Central Time, almost exactly six days into the mission. Just a beautiful touchdown in White Sands this evening. Oh, wow. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. Eight, yeah. Seven, oh, six, wow. five, four, three, two, one. Oh, my gosh. Oh, wow. Awaiting visual confirmation. All right. Let's see. We got it? Waiting. Waiting. And we have an impact, <laughs> a family for humanity in the name of planetary defense. Woo. Three, two, one, boosters in ignition. And liftoff of Artemis One. We rise together back to the moon and beyond. All four RS-25 engines on the core stage and two solid rocket boosters now propelling the vehicle at 128 miles per hour. Hearing good, con good control on the roll from teams in Mission Control Houston. All good calls so far. Now 30 seconds into the flight of Artemis 1. And as we continue to marvel in this spectacular image here in Mission Control Houston, you have a great view of the orbital maneuvering system or OHMS engine, that main engine on the top left of your screen there that was used an hour and 43 minutes ago to perform the OTC or out bound trajectory correction maneuver, as well as a few of the auxiliary engines on the bottom of the European service module, flanked by the solar array, ring, solar array wing on the right portion, right above the Earth on your screen. Can you talk a little bit about some of the features that we are seeing on the lunar surface here? Yeah, absolutely. So if you look, um, 
on the on the moon right now to the left uh, middle area of the moon there, the bright spot that you see there, that's Copernicus Crater. Um, the dark region uh, that is sort of like right in front in the middle center of the moon right now, that's the Imbrium Basin. And so these are impact features um, that we have on the moon. So when the moon formed throughout its history um, over its 4.5 billion years, uh, has been bombarded by meteorites and, and asteroids. Uh, and uh, for the Imbrium, that's the darker round uh, area that you can see there, um, what happened is it's a massive crater, and so we call these a basin, um, and melt from the interior of the moon came up through cracks and then filled that, that basin crater. And you can imagine that as a, as a big lava lake, um, and then a cool to form basalt. The same thing happens at the moment on Earth, um, Hawaii is erupting, and that brings back, uh, brings up basalt from the from the interior of Earth. So these basalt samples, um, when we analyze them and we look at these, uh, we can learn something about the interior of the moon. Uh, I see that we lost our actual live view, but in this beautiful uh, view that we can see here, uh, you can really nicely see Copernicus. Uh, uh, right in the in the center, the and that's brighter um, because it excavates uh, crustal material, which is white or, or bright compared to the mare, which are basalt, which is dark. Um, oh, there we are back. So Copernicus is now in the what lower right corner of that image. Um, that's a fairly young crater, um, and that's why it still appears fairly bright, um, because over time, uh, when the sun interacts with lunar rocks, uh, it darkens over time, so we call that space weathering. Um, yeah. And so we are flying fairly close to some of the Apollo landing sites now. We're a little too high above. We're about 2,000 miles away from the moon still to make out any features. But can you talk about a little bit about what the Apollo program studied in those landing zones and maybe touch on how Artemis is going to be different because we're going to be landing in an ent entirely different spot, right? Yeah, absolutely. Um, Apollo wasn't so much about science. It was more about like, hey, we're actually going to the moon and we can do it and like the technology. To, to show that we can do it. Um, Apollo 14 and 12 sort of landed um, near Copernicus, like south of, of where Copernicus crater is right now that I pointed out in that region. Um, and so uh, Apollo uh, 14 um, landed there in 1971, uh, right above the Framora region, which is kind of like south of Copernicus, and it's right at the edge uh, of that big Imbrium basin that I, that I talked about. Splashdown. From Tranquility Base to Taurus Litro to the tranquil waters of the Pacific, the latest chapter of NASA's journey to the moon comes to a close. Orion, back on Earth. Unofficial splashdown time, 11.40 and 30 seconds a.m. Central Time. At a mission elapsed time of 25 days, 10 hours, 54 minutes, 50 seconds. That's unofficial. Splashing down off the coast of Baja, California, 